for all verified facts. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and click the bell icon to get the latest updates. Hello and welcome. Uh, at over 350,000 cases or close to 350,000 cases a day, uh, India is obviously now uh, almost at the precipice. Now, the larger question is, as we uh, battle with the second wave, with the numbers either getting worse or improving in different parts of the country, where is this headed? What are we learning new about this airborne disease, which has now uh, uh, held us uh, ransom uh, and uh, for, for more than a year now and likely for a longer time? What, are, what can we do to bring back some amount of normalcy without, uh, without uh, compromising our position and our learnings and ensuring that we don't go into a third wave? So to understand this uh, in terms of both lessons from our own epidemiological data as well as global experiences, I'm joined by epidemiologist, health economist and senior fellow uh, at the Federation of American Scientists, uh, Dr. Eric Fiegelding. Uh, he is uh, earlier, he used to be a faculty and researcher at Harvard Medical School and has a dual doctorate in epidemiology. Uh, uh, Dr. Fiegelding, thank you very much for joining us. So tell us about how you are seeing the progression of the virus at this point of time, even as it uh, abates in some parts of the world uh, and uh, uh, you know moves much is moving much faster in countries like India. Thank you for having me. The virus is obviously going wherever there is minimal mitigation and minimal vaccination. Vaccines, of course, are in some ways a luxury in this world where there's such a limited supply. But even without vaccines, we can mitigate the spread of the virus. And we have to mitigate by realizing that this virus is an airborne aerosol virus. It stays in the air um, and can float long distances and it builds up concentration indoors. And wherever people fail to learn that the dangers of indoor dining or indoor meeting places with poor ventilation, that is how the virus spreads the fastest. And of course, whenever given the chance to super spread in mass rallies, whether religious or political or sports games, the virus gets further, further ahead. And unless we learn from these lessons, we're not going to be able to stay ahead of it uh, because this virus is a very pernicious virus. It will stay in the air for 20 minutes to four hours um, without any other changing conditions. And this is why this virus has taken over the world because right. even when you're affected, uh, 30 to 50 percent of all infections are due to asymptomatic transmission. You think you're healthy, no symptoms whatsoever, but the virus will still transmit. And that's what's been so frustrating in start stopping it. Right. So now uh, uh, a country like India, for instance, obviously the infectiousness that we are seeing today and now is much greater than what we saw in the first wave. And that perhaps is what led to us being more complacent as well. So what do we, how do we understand it at a very broad level, uh, the, the nature of mutations and how they will or likely to spread? Yeah, so there's definitely the variant now driving uh, the second wave in India. And variants, uh, they, they're just like any evolutionary driven factor, they basically arise when there's selective pressure uh, to arise. And so also when there's given more warm bodies, more hosts to infect, that is also when it will thrive and learn to adapt. And over many, many months, over a year, the virus has learned to adapt in many ways. There's a South African variant that has a lot of reinfection risk, and the South African variant has the greatest immune escape. Um, it doesn't mean the vaccine won't work. It's just m much weaker against it. Uh, there's the UK B117 that is more contagious and 60% more severe. Uh, and B117 also infects kids more. And the UK, uh, and the also the India variants, um, B1617, B1618, the double and triple mutant, as some call it. It's worrisome because it has the properties of some of the worst variants um, we've seen elsewhere. Now, we don't know the exact contagiousness, but we do know generally the more warm bodies, as again, uh, the virus has, the more it will mutate. And the virus, think of a virus like, like a pole vaulter. Um, the, the the virus that is most successful and able to jump over a fence of people who have previous mild um, immunity, that's the virus that's going to survive and then further proliferate and spread. 
And obviously India has given a lot of chances for it to mutate before. So these variants, they will keep rising unless we stop it with either the masking, which works just as before, uh, vaccines, which works just as before, but we have to keep doing it and distancing. But the difference is the virus will grow faster than we can vaccinate because you know, for every person infected, the virus will infect five or six or eight more people. Well, for everyone vaccinated, I can't just immediately give them five or six vaccine syringes to syringe, uh, vaccinate the next person. We just don't work at the same pace of the virus. So this is why we have to mitigate at the same time we uh, vaccinate. And mitigation masks, and especially double masks or premium masks, I think is really key. That's what a lot of European countries do now mandate for any public activity, premium FFP2, KN95 uh, grade masks. Um, right. And of course, distancing, but distancing in India is much more difficult. But there's also technological solutions such as like in a simple classroom, a HEPA filter. Now, HEPA filters cost around $200 in the West, but that's a one-time investment and it's only less than $10 per child per classroom. And obviously in, in India, we can probably make it even cheaper. But if we put this in every classroom, every meeting room, we can have a greater huge reduction in cases and have some return to normalcy. But we need all of these solutions, not relying it on just one. Um, testing alone is is not enough. Testing works. It It's like a big rake that will rake out most of the cases, but it's not perfect. It will miss some cases. This is why we need a mask, why we need the distancing, and of course, the vaccines whenever they can come. Right. And, and do you see, uh, uh, given your own understanding of numbers as are visible, the, the second wave in India peaking shortly? Yeah, so the problem in India is there's a huge underdiagnosis. There's a lack of testing, as you know, and that's partly seen in the positivity rates. Uh, in some places in uh, Kolkata, it's uh, near 50%, but overall it's 25% in, in, in many parts of India right now. That means um, for every four stones you turn over, you're finding the virus underneath them. And that means that in the forest, there's a lot more other cases that we're not turning the stones over to find um, uh, to find the virus. And so the problem is we don't have a good grasp of how many total cases. The testing is not exponentially increasing like the viruses. So there's some estimates uh, that we're undercounting by 10x. But the, the one uh, uh, latest estimate by IHME, Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, the a uh, big epidemiology uh, firm uh, institute in the University of Washington says there's 58x underdiagnosis. Is that for a quarter million daily cases confirmed in India, there's actually 13 to 14 million daily new cases. Um, that's obviously a very high number. They believe that uh, hopefully it, the cases will stop increasing this coming week, that it will start dropping but the mortality will keep going. That's the problem. Mortality is a lagging indicator and mortality obviously goes up whenever you have lacks of oxygen, but mortality will keep increasing for about two more weeks into mid-May, but it will slowly come down, but not that quickly. And uh, IHME predicts that by August, there could be potentially a million cases, a million deaths. And whether or not that number is true, we know the reality of the, funeral, right. cremations, there is so much. And we do not have enough testing to actually um, be an effective measure right now to fully stop the virus. Because if you have enough testing, you can use it as a tool to stop the transmission. But if you don't have enough testing right now, we can't even use it as a tool to slow the transmission. And we don't even have uh, any sense of how many cases. And that's why we are literally driving in the middle of a pandemic at midnight with no headlights. And that's the scary thing because we don't know how many true cases there are. We don't know how many true deaths there are. Uh, in many countries, we can eventually see the excess deaths, but we don't know how many excess deaths there are being burned a day. And we don't really know right. what is the true extent. 
and this is what is so scary because would you drive right. down the down the road at, at 100 miles per hour in the dead of mid midnight with no lights on that is what we are facing right now and that's why what india's situation is so so scary right uh, last question so and and assuming you know as as you said for various reasons uh, uh, including the fact that we have lockdowns in many parts of the country uh, uh, there is vaccination going on though of course those numbers are much smaller uh, we will see uh, cases peaking out and then uh, dipping down as we've seen it earlier so what happens after that i mean is this uh, uh, is this likely to be stable state for some time or could we well see another resurgence after a few months we could very mu much well see another resurgence and to be clear the reason only reason we think it will slow down is not that the uh, interventions in india are currently really working because clearly india is only 1.6% fully vaccinated 8.7% single dose vaccinated the main reason we think it will slow down is it will infect too, just too many people it it will infect again this is a dangerous type of herd there's vaccine herd and then there's natural infection herd and as it keeps infecting potentially 10 million uh, people or more a day eventually it will run out of people and then it'll slow down uh, as it has less people but the number one lesson is it can come back the, the more millions of people it infects it will learn to how to adapt and out of millions it will learn which is most successful in evading uh, previous infection. And so we think that it could theoretically come back once it learns how to evade the immunity of our current um, built up immunity against it. And this is why uh, we are playing this yo-yoing up and down roller coaster because the first wave, the old Wuhan 1.0 virus has almost disappeared. It do almost doesn't exist anywhere in the world anymore, other than a few pockets that has never seen many cases. But it's the new surge, the B117 UK variant, the South Africa variant with high reinfection, uh, the Brazil P1 variant with really, really fast 2x to 2.5x transmission, faster transmission, and large uh, re reinfection fraction. It's these faster spreading ones that have reinfection potential those are the ones that are now thriving around the world and i don't think that uh, south africa variant or the brazil variant will be the last variant and i am worried about the india uh, b1617 b1618 variants could also be kind of like the south africa variant and brazil variant that they're very evasive towards pre-existing immunity to the old virus so we right. could be entering a new pandemic, and that's the worry. Right, and 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 let me sort of slip in another question. So uh, on on vaccines, you said that uh, you know in some cases the vaccine may not be as effective. Uh, where do we stand on that today? I mean, uh, India is of course uh, manufacturing vaccines and is all set to import uh, new vaccines. Uh, the United States, uh, there there seem to be some confusion on whether the United States is actually providing all the raw materials and excess. AstraZeneca vaccines that it has and either way, uh, you know, where is all this going to land up or likely to land up given our demand? Yeah, so first of all, uh, the US is uh, pl planning to uh, share 60 million of its excess AstraZeneca vaccine doses because US has enough of the other ones. The issue I want to clarify is, first of all, there is no ban on exports of raw materials from the US. Uh, the the CEO of Serum Institute of India even said so uh, for what they're lacking is some materials for Covivax, which is not even approved in any uh, country, US or, or India. So they're just trying to stockpile that. And there's there the US has something called the Defense Production Act. It basically says during an emergency, you have to these companies have to prioritize US production. And if the company has extra beyond the U.S. requirements for production, then yes, it can also ship to other countries. So it's not a ban more, uh, it's more of a prioritization. Right. And it doesn't affect Covishield. The CEO of the Serum Institute says it doesn't, the raw material shortage doesn't affect um, Covishield per se. And the U.S. will also send more materials for Covishield as well. And also India, in terms of yesterday, I, 
uh, I think the announcement was the federal government in India will not buy more of uh, and import more vaccines. They'll develop more internally. Um, and they're letting states, local states and private companies buy more. But my sources say that is a very bad plan. S having states purchase it using their own non-central government uh, uh, budgets to do it is not very feasible in the long run. And companies to do it will lead to eventually price gouging. And that's not the best way. The vaccinations should be free. It should be done and ordered in the hundreds of millions. And only at the federal level can you do that. So it's very frustrating to see that. Altogether, I think vaccines are coming. The US will definitely share more. And But the first batch of US vaccines actually couldn't be shared because the Trump Operation Warp Speed contracts prohibit those early batches of vaccines from being shared with any other country and used outside the United States. Right. And But the new batches of Biden ordered vaccines can be shared with the world. And the Biden administration is gonna ramp up production of a lot of these vaccines for the world. So look forward the second half of the year, there'll be much, much more in addition to the US donating 60 million AstraZeneca and $4 billion to COVAX. Right, uh, Dr. Fickelding, thank you very much for uh, speaking to us. Uh, do hope to circle back to you in coming days. Thank you. Stay safe.